Members of Israel's parliament are in Taipei and talking about what Iran's attack over the weekend means for Taiwan. The apparent suicide of a young Taipei judge has highlighted the often overwhelming workload for those in Taiwan's justice system. We take a look at why young innovators are looking to Taiwan's southern countryside to launch their new startups. Plus, in a slam dunk for cultural ties, a basketball team of young Maoris from New Zealand is in Taiwan, exploring their historical connections with Taiwan's indigenous groups. A warm welcome to Time Plus News. I'm Betty Chen. The United States says it will not participate in any counter-strikes against Iran. That's after Iran launched an unprecedented attack on Israel with 300 missiles and drones. Haime Okan reports. Hundreds of drones and missiles explode in mid-air as they are intercepted by Israeli forces on Saturday. These are some of the images captured from Iran's first direct attack on Israeli soil in more than 45 years. The United Nations Security Council is calling for restraint and pushing for dialogue to prevent further escalation. And U.S. national security officials say they won't help Israel take any offensive actions against Iran. Now, whether and how the Israelis will respond, uh, that's going to be up to them. We understand that and respect that. But the president's been very clear. We don't seek a war with Iran. We're not looking for escalation here. We will continue to help Israel defend itself. Iran and its partners inside Syria, Iraq and Yemen attacked Israel with an estimated 120 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles and more than 170 drones. With help from the U.S. and other regional allies, Israel says it managed to intercept the overwhelming majority of these threats outside its borders, keeping casualties and damage to a minimum. <laughs> שיחד ירתו את רובם המכריע של האיומים. ירתנו 99% מהאיומים ששוגרו לשטח מדינת ישראל. זהו הישג אסטרטגי משמעותי מאוד. Iran says Saturday's attack was a response to a suspected Israeli strike against the Iranian embassy in Syria. Iran and Israel have been fighting what many describe as a shadow war for decades, trading missile and drone strikes. But that conflict is coming out into the open as the war in Gaza between the Iranian-backed Hamas militant group and Israel enters its seventh month. Iran says it warned countries in the region before the attack to try to minimize escalation. Many countries closed their airspace in preparation for the attack, but the United States denies any advance notice. Now all eyes are on Israel and a possible retaliatory strike, with some fearing the conflict could escalate into nuclear war. But others say Saturday's attack was more for show. I mean, it's a paradigm shift. What I've been saying is that, you know, the shadow war between Israel and Iran is now out in the open. But given that, Iran did it in a very calibrated way. So it was kind of performative, um, but it was nevertheless a paradigm shift because it was a direct Iranian retaliation on Israel for Israeli attacks on Iranians. Although casualties from Iran's attack were minimal, the conflict in Gaza continues to spread beyond its borders. Now the world is holding its breath as this regional conflict moves closer to a global war. Jaime Okan and Kamashu for Taiwan Plus. Members of the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, are in Taiwan. They've been talking about what Iran strikes mean for Taiwan. Taiwan Plus reporter Louise Watt was at their press conference at Israel's uh, de facto embassy in Taipei. Louise, what has the delegation been saying? 
This is a small delegation, a bipartisan delegation of Israel from Israel's parliament who's visiting Taiwan. And it also includes the chairman of the Taiwan-Israel Friendship Group. And he said that Taiwan was, I quote, one of the first to stand with us, not just in the latest attack, but also the October 7th attack by Hamas. And he says that the delegation has received nothing but solidarity and compassion on their visit to Taipei. Now, he said the attack was not just an attack on Israel, but also the free and democratic world. And he said that Taiwan and Israel have a lot in common. He said they're two small, strong democracies in a very harsh environment. This is, of course, a reference to China um, and the increasing military pressure on Taiwan. Now, they say that Taiwan and Israel should work closer together. Does this include military cooperation? Well, the delegation was coy on this. They refused to say whether they were going to be meeting with the defense ministry. Um, and when asked, well, have you been giving advice to Taiwan on how it can protect itself uh, against China? They just said that all their discussions were very much behind closed doors. What has Taiwan said about Iran's attack? Well, the delegation met earlier today with President Tsai, and she expressed her condolences for the attack, and she condemned the use of violence by Iran. Taiwan's Foreign Minister, Joseph Wu, he says that Taiwan has joins other democratic countries worldwide in condemning Iran's attack on Israel. And Taiwan's Foreign Ministry has basically urged all parties to get talking to avoid escalating tensions in the region. And they've also warned against all unnecessary travel to both Israel and Iran. And that's because after Iran's attack on Israel, everyone, both in the region and beyond, is still waiting to see what Israel's reaction will be. Thank you, Luis. That was Luis Watt talking to us live from central Taipei. Singaporean Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong has announced plans to step down on May 15th, handing power to his deputy Lawrence Wong. Lee has been Prime Minister since 2004. The 72-year-old had planned to retire earlier, but stayed on through the COVID-19 pandemic. His successor Wong will be Singapore's fourth leader since its independence in 1965. The recent magnitude 7.2 earthquake in Taiwan has renewed debates over who pays for repairs to aging buildings. John Ben Chires has this report. A hail of tiles falls from a tall building, narrowly missing a person walking by. Taiwan is full of tiled buildings, and many of their facades have been shaken loose by the recent Hualien earthquake. But tiles falling from buildings is nothing new, and people sometimes get hit. In 2015, someone in Taipei was even killed. Most buildings with tiled facades are old, and as these buildings age, reports of tiles falling are on the rise. Heavily built-up New Taipei saw 102 reports of falling tiles in 2019. By 2023, that number had risen to 313. It's possible this trend will continue. Over 700,000 buildings in the city are over 30 years old. The average cost for fixing a damaged building is over 300,000 U.S. dollars. And after each incident, neighborhood politicians hear the same question, who pays? It's not just splitting the bill that's a problem. All occupants of a building also have to agree to do repairs in the first place. This means many building facades end up slowly falling apart. Laws might help to settle the issue, but there are not regular inspections of building facades. There's talk in the legislature of creating support and incentives for repairs to building facades and for making the government responsible for carrying repairs out. But these remain ideas for now. 
the earthquake and the damage it's caused are a reminder that despite years of discussion, the appetite for action is limited. Eason Chen and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. It's been almost two weeks since the earthquake block rose and broke down an incinerator in Hualien. The shutdown has led to landfills in the city piling up. Irene Lane has the story. Mountains of trash left in the heat. A growing problem for the residents in eastern Taiwan's Hualien County. It's been almost two weeks since a 7.2 magnitude earthquake struck this coastal county. With the epicenter only 18 kilometers from here, Hualien's port city is the most densely populated in the county, with some 88,000 people. The quake blocked roads connecting the city to its newly built power-generating incinerator in the countryside, where waste from here is burned. Road recovery will take nearly two months, leaving the trash piling up. Hualien used to rely on the neighboring county's incinerators, but it began handling its own waste when the country's first power-generating incinerator was built here a year ago. It has a capacity of 100 tons. But beyond just damaging the roads to it, the recent quake has also shut down the facility, and repairs won't be done until May. With the trash staying put for a while, officials say they have activated some emergency measures. With temperatures rising as summer approaches, Hualien's residents are left with little choice but to endure the smell. A new reality here until the incinerator and the roads are back in business. Scott Huang and Irene Lin for Taiwan Plus. Childcare workers in Taiwan have been facing a sharp uptick in formal complaints one year after a law was passed to protect children in preschool. The law is meant to protect children from improper punishment at the hands of caretakers. Courts can levy fines of over 18,000 US dollars for violating the law. It comes as Taiwan's childcare industry has seen an exodus of talented workers. But childcare worker unions say low salaries and long working hours have had a bigger impact than the new law. The recent suicide of a judge in Taiwan has ignited a debate about the workload of judges and other legal professionals. Chris Goring brings us the story. On April 12th, the body of a Shilin district judge was found outside a dormitory building for judges, having apparently taken his own life. The judge was under 40 years old and had recently told his wife he was feeling extremely overworked. The case has sparked debate over the workloads faced by judges in Taiwan, a debate that's especially lively in the legal community. In the legal circle, people are talking about it like everywhere because it's really like a shocking news. You have to know that uh, the judge that uh, committed suicide like la last week, he's young and very talented, you know, like maybe like 10 years ago. he I, I, be I believe like he never thought he would end his life like this, like this system, this working environment would just crush him like this. At least one lawyer says the large increase in the number of criminal cases stems from a wave of fraud busts, which have swamped the justice system in recent years. Yet the number of people staffing the courts has remained the same. One former prosecutor turned lawmaker says times have changed. And as working conditions get worse, fewer people want to work in the legal system, leading to a vicious cycle. You can see there's a trend that uh, in the Taiwan court, you either have a very, very old judges or you have very, very young judges. So there are many and many people are leaving this career and making this, this system um, vulnerable because many senior uh, judges, they, they choose just 
to run away because they cannot just endure this kind of like stressing a working environment anymore. And they don't see hope here. With cases piling up and no end to the personnel shortage in sight, getting Taiwan's legal system in order will not only be essential to a healthy judicial system, but also to the mental health of those working in it. Eason Chen and Chris Gorin for Taiwan Plus. Young entrepreneurs are finding a home for their startups in the Taiwanese countryside. Our reporter Tiffany Wong heads to the south to find out how a new initiative is supporting the country's growing creative tech industry. Fighting ghosts through augmented reality. This game, supported by the new Jiayi Culture and Technology Innovation Lab, combines Taiwanese history with the latest tech to take players to a different time and place. It's run by one of many new startups taking root in the southern county, a place that's also uniquely inspired their product. So in this culture, we Many of these new tech talents found Jiayi by chance, like Zhi Xiang Ou, who's from nearby Yunlin County, but studied mechanical engineering in Jiayi. He's now a product manager at a startup that uses VR and AR to provide industrial solutions. He says that in Jiayi, he feels a sense of teamwork as startups grow together. Uh, Jiayi is known for its agriculture, but has recently been developing its tech industry. And local officials say their next step is to convince young innovators from the county to stay in their hometown. And that transformation is already beginning, as more people seek opportunities at the new science park under construction and as young students get a head start on tech education. Jiayi may soon be known for much more than its agriculture, adding new, innovative and cultural technology to its credentials, too. Andy Xue and Tiffany Wong in Jiayi County for Taiwan Plus. Coming up, we'll hear about a new treatment for one of Asia's deadliest diseases. Stay tuned. Have a nice dream. Discover the beauty of Taiwan every Sunday, 9 p.m. on Taiwan Plus. Welcome back. You're watching Taiwan Plus News. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has vowed to build long-lasting ties with China. Kim made a comment in a meeting with China's National People's Congress Chairman Zhao Leji in Pyongyang. Zhao's visit marks the first of several expected exchanges this year to mark the 75th anniversary of diplomatic ties between the two countries. China is North Korea's most important source of economic aid and diplomatic support. According to China state media, Zhao and Kim agreed to boost exchanges and cooperation. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is on a three-day state visit to China to address trade rifts and geopolitical tension. Scholz will meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping and Premier Li Qiang while visiting several Chinese cities. China is Germany's top trading partner, but its trading practices and relationship with Russia have left Berlin trying to balance economic and security needs. 13,000 people have been evacuated from Russia's southern Kurgan region, just as extreme flooding is expected to peak. Russia and neighboring Kazakhstan have been grappling with the worst flood in decades for at least 10 days. Hundreds of thousands of people have been forced to abandon their homes, fleeing rising water coming from unprecedented fast-melting snow and heavy rain. Both countries have declared a state of emergency in multiple regions. At least 14 people have died in a landslide triggered by heavy rain in the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. Local officials in the island's mountains are conducting rescue efforts to find missing people. The search has been hampered by damaged roads and poor weather. Floods and landslides killed at least 26 people on the Indonesian island of Sumatra last month. 
Tuberculosis is one of Asia's deadliest diseases, and treating it is only getting harder. But as Harrell Hughes reports, a new treatment is bringing hope for a change. Local cook Efefanio Briante was unprepared for the amount of antibiotics he would have to take when he was diagnosed with tuberculosis, or TB. Up to 20 tablets each day. The side effects left him feeling so sick he could not eat or work. In 2022, an estimated 10.6 million people fell ill with TB, most of them in the Asia-Pacific region, where Briante's native Philippines has the highest prevalence rate. It is the world's second leading infectious killer after COVID-19. The bacterial disease is curable and preventable, but treatment is expensive and includes daily painful injections or a fistful of pills for months and the disease is becoming increasingly resistant to these antibiotics. For many patients, like Briante, it was too much. He stopped taking antibiotics after two weeks, even though he knew it could be fatal. Then he heard of a trial for a new treatment called BPOL, which was developed by the International TB Alliance. Ito yung uh, SSOR namin before, yung dating gamot na binibigay sa drug-resistant TB. So, ang patient umiinom ng 17 to 20 tablets for 9 to 11 months. So, ito yung BPAL natin. No, uh, ito, um, as you can see, no, mas konti yung tableta niya. And itong gamot na to, iniinom lang siya for 6 months. Researchers are now rolling out the oral regimen across the Asia-Pacific, hoping the side effects are easier, more affordable, and more patients complete the treatment. Thì khi mà có cái phát đồ mới đặc biệt là những cái phát đồ mà số lượng thuốc ít, thời gian thuốc ngắn thì với bọn mình cái lo ngại lớn nhất là gì? Cái lo ngại lớn nhất là bệnh nhân bỏ trị. Và khi bệnh nhân bỏ trị ấy thì nó sẽ khuếch đại những cái kháng thuốc và sau khi mà nó khuếch đại kháng thuốc, kháng thuốc ấy mà bệnh nhân đã kháng với tiếp tục những cái thuốc trong cái phát đồ Vipa này ấy thì sau này cái việc thiết kế phát đồ điều trị cho bệnh nhân ở những cái trường hợp bệnh nhân bỏ trị như thế nó rất là khó. For Briante, he had no problem sticking to the new treatment. Tapos yung BPAL, konti lang ang inumin mo sa mas effective pa. Dire-direcho lang yung six months hanggang sa gumaling ako. BPAL has a 90% cure rate. It's a positive sign for researchers who hope to expand across Asia and bring in a new era free of tuberculosis. Ryan Wu and Harrell Hughes for Taiwan Plus. A Maori basketball team is touring Taiwan. Their visit is aimed at promoting cultural and sporting connections between New Zealand and Taiwan, given that their indigenous links go back thousands of years. Louise Watt went to meet the team. Gearing up for a basketball game, these Maori teams have traveled more than 9,000 kilometers from New Zealand to play against Taiwanese high schools. Their games are meant to forge closer ties between the two countries. And while they're here, the Maoris hope to rediscover their shared roots with Taiwan's indigenous communities. I think we've been aware for decades that um, our DNA comes back to Taiwan. Um, even though um, the indigenous people are the minority here, um, for us it's just making the connection to our past. The team from Rotorua City is on a nine-day tour of Taiwan. And between games, they're visiting and learning about indigenous communities firsthand. Scholars have found that the Maori's ancestors migrated from Taiwan. Their language belongs to the same family as the island's indigenous languages. And they share hunting, face tattoo and other traditional practices with Taiwan's indigenous groups. <laughs> The 
Maori's trip has been organised by a Taiwanese national who used to live in New Zealand and previously ran an international school basketball competition. It's funded in cooperation with the Maori Teams Association and local governments in Taiwan. Indigenous leaders are seeing similarities between them and their guests. These kinds of links help to promote a Taiwanese identity that's distinct from neighboring China, which claims sovereignty over Taiwan and threatens to take it by force. Back on the court, competition got heated. The Maoris lost to the home team in this game, but they're already planning to return and even the score. And it's that strengthened historical and emotional connection that makes this exchange a true victory for Taiwan. Patrick Chen and Louise Watt for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. You can visit the Taiwan Plus website or follow our social media for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. Finally, today, check out these images of Thailand's Songkran Festival, celebrating the annual Thai New Year. I'm Betty Chen. Take care and see you next time.